Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 349 of your Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is The Quiet Epidemic, an interview with filmmakers Lindsay Keys and Winslow Crane Murdoch. My name is Richard Johannesson, and I was blessed to have this episode co-hosted with Phyllis Bedford. Folks, Lindsay Keys and Winslow Crane Murdoch are two folks who were treating for Lyme disease at the same treatment facility. And an enlightened medical assistant recommended that they should pursue a purpose as a vehicle for enhancing their healing. And she encouraged these two folks to meet one another and pursue a purpose together as filmmakers. They did that, they worked together, and the product and manifestation of their purpose is the film known as The Quiet Epidemic. And the film will be dropping May 16th on Amazon, iTunes, and Vimeo On Demand. Folks, without further ado, we're really excited to introduce to you Lindsay Keys and Winslow Crane Murdoch. Lindsay and Winslow, welcome to the Tech Boot Jam podcast. We are so excited to have you. We are in love with your film, and people in our community have been talking about your film for a long time. So it's been a long time coming that we've uh, had you on the podcast. And the good news for our folks is that rather than having Matt Sabatello and his horrible New York accent, butcher this interview, we have someone who speaks English properly and is one of our favorite people in the world, Phyllis Bedford, who's on co So Phyllis, say hi to the folks. Hello, hello. It's wonderful to hear I'm one of your favorite people in the world. Well, Actually, it's just wonderful to be back with you. Thanks, Rich. Well, thank you. And folks know that you're one of our favorite people because I quote you all the time. So even though you're not always with us, your ears must be ringing because I constantly quote you with so many of the cool observations you've been kind of me. So Phyllis, uh, I know these two Young people are like your own children, and I think it would be wonderful <laughs> if you could start to introduce them to the folks in our community. Yeah. First of all, I just want to tell everyone out there listening, I'm the executive director of Limelight Foundation, and that's why I was very nicely asked to come on the podcast in the first place. And what we do, just so you know the connection with the filmmakers, um, we provide treatment grants for children and young adults suffering with Lyme through age 25 who can't afford the care. And thus far, we've given out $8.3 million in grants to 1,200 individuals in 49 states. So that's who we are. Um, but how did I meet um, How did I meet you all? Well, that's actually a great story because I was at the um, Sundance Film Festival about seven years ago. And I, a friend contacted me and said, I'd like to have you talk to this gentleman named Winslow. And he is thinking of making a film. So while I was at Sundance, I was thinking we really need a new and um, just a new take on a Lyme documentary. And I've actually been waiting for one to be made. So when Lynn Winslow called me and said, could we chat? I eagerly said yes. And he kind of mapped out what they were thinking. Now, this was seven years ago. So, I mean, that's a long time. But um, what Winslow said is that he and Lindsay were going to be in the Bay Area. Um, and I said, come stay with us. And why don't you tell us what your vision is? And we actually, at that time, had even talked about maybe using some Limelight grant recipients. And again, this was just in the genesis. So they came, laid it out for us. Um, and that really became, began the, a beautiful friendship between us. And um, I've just been delighted to be involved with the film, along with my husband, Scott, and Limelight Foundation. And um, it's just been really wonderful. Now, I bet everyone out there is wondering about, uh, you know, about your background, where you came from, a bit about your childhood, and just who you are. So um, I think I'm going to ask Lindsay first. Can you just share a little bit about you, and then we'll go to Winslow? But we'd love to learn about you. But well, wait a minute, I, Phyllis. Can I interrupt yeah. for a second? So yeah. when you first met uh, Winslow and Lindsay, and you were wondering what a filmmaker would look like, did Winslow look exactly like a filmmaker <laughs> who would be walking up the silver screen? Or because you remember, this is an audio-only podcast, so. But our folks have had the benefit of seeing how perfectly he portrays or manifests a filmmaker. Did that did that 
uh, did that register with you and your first met him, or am I? I don't alone? know what she thought when she first met us. That's <laughs> that's still what I'm trying well, to figure out. Well, Dan, remember the first uh, my first conversation was over the phone. <laughs> so you know, so he had the filmmaker voice, so that was a really good thing, and and so does Lindsay. But yes, but you know, again, seven years ago, and they're not very old. So I mean, they were we you know we were all kind of novices back then. But yes, to your point, um, they were so sincere and eager and dedicated to what they wanted to do so and that is the that is that is the sign of a good filmmaker so yes he wasn't nearly as cool looking as he is at this exact moment <laughs> pretty sick too i think i was barely standing sick. upright <laughs> that's true well, yeah yeah, but sorry, I'm Lindsay. Lindsay. yeah yeah so you know, it's kind of a long story, but we'll try to get to, through it. Um, people always ask, do you remember when you were bitten? And that's, of course, a really hard question to answer because, you know, only after learning what Lyme disease actually is, did I take a review of my whole life and recognize how many times in my life my unexplained illness was likely due to the bite of a tick. And the first time I can recall was actually in 1998, I was in third grade and I was sick for months. And I remember the feeling of the, the doctors just being baffled and as a child feeling very scared. Like, how do they not know? How do the doctors not know what's going on with me? And so I missed months of school and they kind of just eventually said, let's just call it mono. Let's just, let's just say it was mono. And I've since learned that that can be a common misdiagnosis of Lyme in children, something to do with the blood work looking similar. Um, but no one ever mentioned Lyme, even though I grew up in the woods in upstate New York. Uh, we had no awareness in my family. And I actually had never heard of the word Lyme until in 10th grade, I had a bullseye rash on my collarbone. It was perfect. It was the perfect bullseye rash. And I watched it for weeks. I watched it evolve for weeks and I thought, this is so strange. I remember looking at it in the mirror and it was in the summer and I, I, I was like, what is, what is this? And then eventually someone at a barbecue said, that looks like Lyme disease. And it's the weirdest thing, but I somehow knew that that was going to become a part of my life. I just, it was a kind of eerie feeling that word Lyme disease. I thought, oh, there, this is, this feels weird. Thankfully, my pediatrician was pretty, uh, he was pretty forward thinking and he knew that the tests were unreliable. So he treated me with doxy, even with a negative test. And I think he, you know, probably saved my life so that I had a very functional childhood. You know, I was an athlete and a student and, and I didn't consider myself to be sick, although I did uh, feel aching in my arms and my hands whenever a storm was coming. And it was sort of like, this question in the back of my mind, like, might that be related? But I just kind of brush it off. And, and it really wasn't until college that I started to become much sicker. And I think that's because I went to college in Connecticut at a, a college called Wesleyan University. I actually remember taking photographs of my boyfriend at the time in a field in Lyme, Connecticut, and pulling a tick off of him. And I never thought to check myself. And about a year later, all of these strange symptoms started to appear. I had a full body rash. I had intestinal bleeding. I had reoccurring uh, throat infections that none of which was unexplained. And I just kept getting slammed with IV cocktails of morphine and steroids and antibiotics for what the doctors thought was strep throat. And I think that's what saved me. I got almost a year of antibiotics for reoccurring strep throat. And I never would have gotten those antibiotics if I had had a diagnosis of Lyme disease. That's wild. So then, you know, I, I had some surgeries. That's what they resorted to, you know, let's just snip and cut certain things out. And, and I was, I was pretty okay until I moved to Martha's Vineyard in 2013. <laughs> and that's when I got to know Lyme disease as I know it now. It was you know, tingling and numbness in my hands, my feet, my face, I couldn't turn my neck, uh, was eventually bedridden, still didn't understand what was going on. And it was my boss who said, you know, I think you should talk to my friend who's a nurse. And she put me on the phone with this woman and I'll never forget it. She said, oh yeah, it sounds like you have Lyme, but uh, first of all, ticks carry more than Lyme. And I was like, what? 
<laughs> and she says, and no doctor on Martha's Vineyard will diagnose or treat you properly. And this was a nurse. And it was this eerie feeling that came over me again, because my mom was very sick at the time going through her own quest for a diagnosis. You know, she was given diagnoses of MS and ALS and some rare genetic condition for which there's no name. And, and, and she kept telling me about how she thought she had Lyme. So I thought, this is bizarre. How could it be that my mom and I both might have Lyme disease? I mean, isn't that a rare condition? And, and, and isn't that easily diagnosed and treated? How bizarre is this? And eventually I got put in touch with this one. I don't even know who she was. I don't know if she was a doctor or a nurse or who she was. I got put in touch with a woman on Martha's Vineyard who I was told would be the only person who would actually help me. And I walked into this office and she said, she was furious. She said, I'm not even going to test you. I see 10 people a day like you. I know that you have Lyme disease. Take this doxy, four weeks of doxy. And if you're not better, come back. And I thought, what do you mean if I'm not better? I've already had Lyme disease and I was treated and, and I was fine. What do you mean if I'm not better? And I took it and I was fine and I forgot about it until a year later when all of the symptoms started to come back. I was living in New York City at that point. And I thought, oh no, could it be? And my mom, of course, was saying, yes, it can be. These are all the things I've learned about Lyme. There's a controversy and the antibiotics don't always work. And I actually thought that my mom was kind of misguided. And that's a really bizarre <laughs> irony that, you know, I didn't believe her entirely. And I myself, yes, was suffering from Lyme. My symptoms all returned. They got much worse. Eventually I lost my ability to basically function. I couldn't remember how to get home from work. I was having compulsive suicidal ideation, which I'm not experiencing anymore, thank God. Um, I felt like I was being electrocuted 24 seven. I mean, all of the awful symptoms, I don't even want to continue going there because we all know them so well. And I had no choice at that point, but to make an appointment with a Lyme specialist that didn't accept insurance, the whole path that I had watched my mom go down that I thought she was crazy, frankly, for following, I was, a, I had to go down it. I had no choice. So I'll stop there. That's, that's actually the nutshell story, believe it or not. But I'll, I'll pick up there after Winslow shares about his personal Lyme journey. Wow, Lindsay, that is, <laughs> That is, that is a lot. And I think, you know, all probably everyone listening and I'm sitting here nodding my head. Um, this sounds so familiar to so many of us, but thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Winslow. Yeah. Let's see. Um, you know, I think similar to Lindsay, when I think back on my life growing up in upstate New York, you know, ticks were always uh, a part of it. We had a cat. Uh, we had a, he was supposed to be a barn cat who became an inside cat who would bring ticks into our house all the time, would also scratch my arms all the time. And I think, you know, growing up, there was always these sort of strange things happening. You know, I think of it now as thresholds that we have this, we have our threshold that's up here and we're slowly building, building, building until we sort of tip over the edge. For me, I had sinus infections all through college and I was on antibiotics for that. Um, no probiotics, interestingly, um, and, you know, just was able to remain functional through college, but uh, ha always had these strange things going on. And then in 2013, I was bit by two ticks on a climbing trip in upstate New York. And I came home, I had a little bit of a rash, but it wasn't a bullseye rash. Um, I knew about Lyme disease because my mother had had it, but I didn't think it was that serious. Um, but I did go to the doctor to get tested for it within the first four to six weeks of being bitten. The test came back negative um, and I forgot about it. And that summer I started getting sicker and sicker. I had all the, sort of the summer flu signs of headaches and joint pain and all these things. And I just thought I was stressed out. Um, and then that year I spent seven months driving across the country working on a different film project that I was working on right out of college about student loan debt. 
And I was just having the strangest things pop up, but um, I wasn't eating well. I was sleeping in my car. I was sleeping on people's couches. And I was like, I guess this is just what happens when you spend seven months on strangers' couches. <laughs> um, and uh, so slowly I, I returned home after that and was, I returned back to the East Coast and was working in Boston. And that summer I was starting to get really sick and noticing I was working a desk job uh, for a magazine and I, I was, um, just getting really intense headaches and just feeling run down and just not feeling myself. Um, finally that fall, I moved home because I was on my parents' health insurance and I couldn't see a doctor in Boston. And I decided that I needed to go try to figure this out. Still didn't tell anyone, didn't tell my parents, didn't tell any of my friends. Um, but I started going to see the doctor and finally that winter, it got so bad that I, I felt like I was, you know, I, I felt like I was dying. I, I thought I had a brain tumor. I was, I was having insane headaches. I was losing my memory. I was losing my ability to focus, my ability to find words. Um, and finally I had to, I had to tell my mom, <laughs> I said, Hey, I really don't feel good. Um, and, and so she jumped on board as moms do and, and started to help me try to figure it out. It was a whole long carousel as it is with so many Lyme patients of getting passed from doctor to doctor to doctor and, you know, seeing every different specialist going to the office and then people being like, well, I don't focus on that. I actually only focus on this. So let's send you three weeks later to the next person who focuses on this one specific part of your body. Um, it went from the diagnosis of brain tumor all the way down to depression to some guy just saying, hey, try antidepressants and see if that helps. Until finally I ended up in a clinic in Albany, New York um, that my mom had heard of that was actually an integrative cancer clinic, um, but they spent more time with you. And she said, hey, you know, why don't we go try this out and see what happens? And it was there, I think that was like March or April of 2015. And I remember right away they were like, we think you have Lyme disease. And my first response was, I don't think Lyme disease can be this bad. I've heard about Lyme disease and, and I don't think this is it. And they were like, here's four antibiotics that we want you to try to take. Um, here's an anti-malarial for Babesia. Um, this is what we think you have. And I was like, this is way too much and way too far. I want to wait until the blood work comes back, which took a month. Um, but at that first appointment, they handed me a, a, a sheet that said, here's why Lyme disease is so controversial. Here's what we just diagnosed you with. And here's what you need to know. And here's the journey that you're going to walk down if you decide to do this, um, which was incredibly disorienting and overwhelming. I think to be young and to be sick is disorienting in and of itself. Um, but then to end up in the Lyme world and to figure out who to trust and whether you're going to do this is, is a really hard thing to do. And luckily, you know, my family had the means to, to help me through that. You know, it, it was such a weird thing to go through six months of doctor's offices only paying copays and finding no answers and then ending up at this place that wanted an initial fee that was pretty high and that didn't take insurance. Um, and to recognize that, wow, if we do this, we're going to have to start spending money for it. But there was no other answer that was provided. And so when the test finally came back positive in, in the end of April, I was like, OK, I guess this is what we're doing. And I uh, jumped on board with Lyme treatment. And pretty immediately, I noticed that um, it at least stopped the decline. It didn't it didn't pull me back right away. It took a very long time, um, but it stopped the decline and it felt like I had found something that was an answer. And so I stuck with it. Wow. Hey, it isn't lost on me that both of your mothers also <laughs> had Lyme. It isn't lost on me. Yeah. And that's part of, part of what I talked about in the podcast that I did is how often that happens. Yeah. Parents have Lyme and kids have Lyme. Yeah. So, and you touch on that in the film, but yeah. we, we're not going to spend time on that, but it, I, I, I haven't heard your whole story before. So this is actually yeah. really interesting. Wow. And wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. And it's pretty incredible that both of you had parents that were, you know, receptive and able to help you. And uh, that, is such a, uh, that is such a gift. Such and a gift. Absolute gift yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, well, let's jump into how you two met. <laughs> and I know it was at a doctor's office, and I know there's a, a special significance of a note. So <laughs> why, <laughs> why don't you tell that story? Yeah, so, so when I made my appointment with the Lyme specialist, um i was a mess and i had no idea if i was going to be able to even provide for myself ever again or work ever again i couldn't even hold a camera at the time but i kept thinking that i really wanted to make a lyme disease documentary 
And I'd actually been thinking about it for years, but I couldn't find anyone who would do it with me because all of my peers were young and working on really cool projects and they didn't want to think about illness or anything, you know, morbid. And, and I was in the throes of this and, and yeah, but I knew that I couldn't do it by myself. And the other hurdle for me was that at the time, my mom was on the verge of declaring bankruptcy because of her medical expenses for Lyme. And I remember thinking, how am I going to raise funding for a documentary when my own mother is about to declare bankruptcy? That just felt very selfish to me. And I, and I, I, it was a block without me even realizing it for a long time until one day I was sitting with her at, at home and and she was in tears over her situation. And I just said to her, mom, like, I feel like I have to choose between helping you and making a movie about Lyme. And she didn't even hesitate for a second. She just said, she, well, I think she looked surprised because she's like, what do you mean? Of course you would make the film. She said, the film's going to help more people, Lindsay. You have to go make the film. And she, we like hugged, which we actually don't do much. So that was significant. <laughs> and she just said, you have to make this film. And so then the next step was again, okay, well, now I have my mom's blessing, but who is going to do this with me? This is just madness. Who's going to believe that this is a story worth telling and then go down this, this journey with me? And so when I wound up at the, the Lyme doctor's office, the first appointment, the nurse practitioner, Jen, who we're still in touch with, she, she asked a question that just changed everything. And, and I think it's a question that I wanna ask everyone listening also, and will continue to ask always, do you have a passion? She said, we find that patients who have a purpose tend to have better outcomes. And she really meant that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to make a film about Lyme or I want to make a film about Lyme. It was more declarative. I, it was the first time that I like, implied that I was actually going to do it. And she looked really excited and she said, we have another patient here who's your age and he's a filmmaker with Lyme. Do you want me to connect the two of you? And it was one of those moments that where like time kind of slows down and your life is like begging you to just like pause and like look at it for a moment. <laughs> it's like, do you see that there's something in front of you right now? It's, and you have to grab it. It was like one of these moments, like everything was just suspended. I was like, oh my God, I have no idea who this person is. I feel like I'm dying. How, how are we gonna do this? But yeah, like, yes yeah, please connect us. So I wrote a note and Winslow still has it. She gave it to him the next day. He happened to have his appointment the very next day. And so, you know, I don't know if we'll get to this at any point in the rest of the conversation, but I just want to say that this project has been so hard and so rewarding. And I've had no doubt since day one that it was actually meant to be and it's really helped me find peace with my own journey knowing that this has come out of it and like meeting Winslow and the fact that I wound up there with that nurse who asked that question and he was coming in the next day just reminds me that when things get hard for us or very uncertain for us I just know in my heart that that it's going to be okay and that the world needed this and that we came together for a reason. And with you too, Phyllis. Yeah, I, I feel the exact same way, you know, for, for my Lyme journey, my family's Lyme journey. I mean, you would never, ever wish this on anyone, right? Yeah. But then you, then you sit back and you think, but my goodness, I mean, I laugh that I'm an executive director of a Lyme foundation. I mean, it's like, oh, <laughs> this isn't, this was not in my, in my, my plan, but just like you. I mean, I think, I think you do, I convinced people do one of two things when they get Lyme as they start recover either. And both are valid. Either they mm -hmm. run away from it as far as they can. Like that was a, 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 a terrible couple of years. And I just have got to get on with life. Or there's the people that are saying, okay, that was absolutely, I fell down a rabbit hole. But now that I'm out of the rabbit hole, what am I going to do with that experience? And how am I going to help others? when they are down in that rabbit hole. So it's, it's, I commend you too, that, you know, you, you move forward and you are, you are changing lives and you are really, I think, going to change the narrative of, of Lyme disease. 
I mean, I'm so excited about this film, more people seeing it, but I totally agree with you. And I think part of our healing, once you just kind of go with it is like, okay, I didn't want to be here. What, what, what are the lessons I'm going to learn through this and what is going to be my purpose through it? So I think that was so aptly put. So absolutely. Okay. So now you two have met. <laughs> come in contact with each other winslow has this cryptic note in his hands <laughs> i have it here <laughs> yeah you have, oh I, I i wish everyone listening could see it <laughs> yeah, um, I, know, I, know. I know you have it on your website i could post a photo of it yes yeah so a photo of it of course so you know loosely take us through what happened next you two probably connected and then decided what to do and then wait fellas fellas I need to hear the note. I'm, I'm <laughs> read the note. I've not seen it. We're all sitting here, hanging at the end. Of the These two brilliant young people come together as a result of a note. I need to hear a Winslow. What did I say? All right, I'll read it for you. Thank it says, you. hi, hi, exclamation point. You know his name. They wouldn't tell me his name because of Hitler. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Hi, <laughs> let's make a documentary about Lyme disease. I've been looking for a collaborator, but it's a tough sell. It's personal and complicated. Working with someone who gets it is essential reach out let's chat best lindsay keys so. okay rich hey, thank rich, you for rich, asking rich, Winslow, she had you at hello <laughs> if he only knew he would have run away if you know. <laughs> so, yeah, she so didn't tell the, me it was going to take seven years before you answer before you answer <laughs> phyllis's question about uh moving forward i need to know what was your reaction you get this she note. meant to say uh, finding someone who's dumb enough to take this on is a tough sell <laughs> 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 finding I, someone I, who's willing to give up the next seven years of their yeah, life yeah 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 um gosh what was my reaction i you know i think it was well yeah it was obviously strange you don't normally walk into a doctor's office and get a note from somebody uh that says to call them about making a documentary i think that um but i you know i think to lindsay's point earlier um there would never felt like it never i don't remember if like you know going over it in my head being like ah am i gonna do this or you know i just got the note i went home i emailed her and i said give me a call if you want to chat here's what i do and and then like uh, it seems like pretty soon after that i was like asleep on her mom's couch as we were like just just like trying to make our way through this and all of a sudden we were like making a film you know before new in the bay area we met phyllis and scott and they were just <laughs> these angels who were like here you go like send you on your journey um and so i think that's that's why it just all feels like it it just happened and um uh, it never felt like a choice it just felt like the path that we were put on and and we just ran with it and tried to do the best that we could and um you know and i think that there was sort of always this you know we we felt like we were just on this on this thing that was moving and we were just sort of trying to keep up with it you know and i think meeting people like phyllis and scott even who were like great we believe in you like go do it i think Lindsay and i would just have these moments where we were like what <laughs> like <laughs> us really like you know we kept pitching this idea but then people would all of a sudden be like yeah sure and we'd be like okay uh <laughs> i didn't expect that answer um <laughs> and so you know it just it just it just was this thing that took off um and yeah incredibly incredibly grateful for it and it was also incredibly difficult um but i think for us you know i think at that point in our lyme journey that was lindsay's first appointment and that was one of my last at that doctor's office um or sort of towards the end of my journey at that doctor's office i think at that point we both knew enough about it to know that there was a, an opportunity here to create something that could be a tool for other people so it didn't have to be as confusing as it was for us um and i think that was always the goal is how do we create something that explains why this is so hard and how do we do it in a way that is actually accessible not just for lyme patients but for people outside of the lyme community i think there's been some amazing media that's come out around lyme but it hasn't necessarily broken out of that bubble and so i think immediately we were like okay with the people that we're meeting phyllis and scott and the bay area lyme foundation and all of the scientists that we're meeting and even early on we were holly ahern up in uh up in the adirondacks and um, mary beth fife for just so many people that we were coming into contact with who we were like these are just really solid believable individuals who are trying to do this in the right way and we want to create something that has that type of tone that 
takes all the anger that we feel, but distills it in a way that can put it out into the world so people can recognize how, how messed up this all is, but also approach it, you know? And I think sometimes that is the hard thing with Lyme messaging is how do you, how do you bring people into this mess without scaring them away? Um, and so that we, we just sort of had that as our North Star from the beginning. I think we were like, amidst all the confusion of everything we were doing, I think we had that at least, like that little nugget was very clear. And so everything was like, okay, how do we find our way to that point? Um, and we met some amazing people along the way who, who helped us to do that. But, but that was the goal and that's, that's sort of, yeah, that's how it all began. So I'm wondering why the two of you decided that you were going to use other people to tell the story as opposed to the way most filmmakers are telling their story about themselves why did you two decide to stay out of the the film and tell the story through other people well i think that you know we considered it in the beginning because we had very little funding in the very beginning we couldn't venture too far from home we were actually kind of just stuck in the local area being like what do we start filming <laughs> well, that's closest to us you know and 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 so we tried and you know it's hard it's hard to make a I, I just think that neither of us really liked seeing ourselves on camera we were like this is kind of <laughs> awkward you know like like yeah. we were and it, and it was also just it's hard to be a filmmaker and it's hard to film and also film yourself like we needed to have both of our eyes sets of eyes and and brains on what was going on around us. I mean, we were so deep in it ourselves that I think it would have become very clouded. And and we also didn't, I don't know, it, I, personally, I just, I don't know, I didn't want it to seem like we were kind of like showing off, like, oh, look how sick, you know, because there's a perception about Lyme patients that they're like faking it for attention and, you know, I think that there was a little bit of that at play too. Not that other people can't do that and that it's not it's not great, but just for me personally, I was just like, there's so many other people. I mean, we were meeting so many people that it was just it just didn't it just became so obvious that there were far more compelling, <laughs> credible people. And you know, I think also we were so sick and like it was hard for us just to film other people. I think like if we had had to be like self-aware of what, what we were saying, I mean, we had a really hard time in the beginning. The people in our lives were very worried about us making this project. I mean, our doctors were like, they, everyone wanted us to make it because they knew that we could pull it off and they wanted to see what we were capable of. But at the same time for our personal health, I think people were like, you know, very concerned about us. I mean, we were pulling these road trips in the beginning. We couldn't even afford flights. You know, we were just driving around the Northeast and Winslow's little like beat up RAV4 that had <laughs> mice. We were like mice RFP, living in it. RFP RAV4. <laughs> mice were living in the RAV4. Well, they were at one point. They were at anymore. one point. <laughs> you know? So it was just, you know, it was just, it just happened that way. And, and, you know, and we ended up meeting such incredible people like, you know, I think it's we can just jump there now. We we met Julia Bruzzese, the main subject of our film, at the same doctor's office that Winslow and I met at. And, you know, she had just been on the news as the miracle girl who was blessed by Pope Francis. And, you know, she, she sort of thrust Lyme into the spotlight when the news cameras came to her and said, why are you in a wheelchair? She said, I have a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease. And Winslow emailed me and said, I just met the miracle girl at the, the office. And that was another kind of like chills moment where it was like, oh, wow, you know, okay, I think that she's a part of this journey with us. And, you know, and she and her family were just in the thick of it, and as were we. And, and Julia is just an incredible person. She's an incredible role model for how you can get through this disease. I don't think I've ever seen, you know, we all fall into our moments, but I don't think I've ever seen Julia like really feel sorry for herself like even after all that she's been through she just has so much grace and a lot of that is like the strength that her family provides her you know a lot of pay people with Lyme like Phyllis mentioned before Winslow and I were so lucky to have family members who believed us so many folks don't have that and I think what Julia and her family show in the film is that there's another way <laughs> you can believe in your loved ones and you can show up for them. And if you do and you fight for them, then they will have a chance to get through this, you know? And so they were just so compelling 
And we met so many other people that we filmed with that actually didn't make it into the final cut of the film, not because they weren't incredible, um, but just because of the way that the story ends up weaving together. Um, but the other the other person that we met was uh, who really, really, really struck us as someone who struck a lot of people in the Lyme community. And that was Dr. Neil Spector. And, you know, Winslow and I were so aware, as he said earlier, that we, you know, why we wanted to make this. We wanted to make a film that could even maybe reach some skeptics, not just the Lyme community, not just the general public, but even the medical community, you know. So we 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 connected with Neil and it just became clear how solid of a person he was, his integrity as a scientist was only i mean his his integrity as a scientist was matched by his heart and his capacity for compassion and feeling he was like the perfect blend of heart and mind and he also trained at harvard and worked at duke and he was he was really engaging folks in the medical community who thought that Lyme was just this easy to diagnose, easy, easy to cure illness. And the fact that he was willing to share his, his world with us was just incredible because now, even though sadly he's, he's no longer with us in physical form, uh, his message lives on through the film. So Winslow, I wanna ask you an, another question about the approach you all took to telling this story. Um, and uh, in addition to loving that you made a film without the two of you in the film, I really love the way you told the film from the standpoint of a family, not from an individual pa a patient. And even more importantly, you told the story through a dad's eyes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the reason that was significant to me, not only because I'm a dad and I have daughters, but it was significant to me because on the, during the course of doing this podcast of 350 episodes, we have a lot of moms who are superheroes and who are standing with their children, but we don't really have a lot of dads, at least publicly, standing behind their children. So another reason your film stood out to me and I and I fell in love with it almost immediately is because you were profiling a family and a dad's relationship with his daughter. So Enzo, can you talk to us about how you brought that perspective to this film and why that was a unique approach, um, at least in the way that the story has been told by other filmmakers? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think we just got lucky. <laughs> I think that the whole family is incredible. Um, Enrico, of course, is incredible. Um, I think it's worth saying, you know, Josephine doesn't show up a lot in the film, but she's absolutely amazing. Julia's mother and she's as supportive as Enrico is, but she, you know, had to be off um, making an income for the family. And so she she was the one sort of who took on that burden while Enrico took on um, Julia's health. And it made sense because he worked as a, um, a respiratory therapist in the hospital before, before Julia got sick. And so he had a medical background, which was very helpful in her treatment. Um, and then also Josephine made, made more than he did at that point. And so they made that decision for him to step in. I think that, you know, Enrico is this amazing participant in the film because he sort of embodies um both this sort of traditional masculine role of being being the father who's who's upset and is willing to go to war for his daughter you know and for his family um but then he's also there holding her and taking care of her and 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 showing her love and hugging her and crying with her and um just sharing these really emotional spaces with his daughter and so I think we really early on just realized that their relationship was so incredible. Um, and I think also, the, you know, there's a decision that was made early on because Julia was so sick. Julia, you know, changed a lot over the course of making this film. And early on, it was a lot harder for her to articulate how she was feeling and to talk to us and to be on camera. You know, there was a lot of shoots that we did with Julia where she was um, pretty much comatose for most of the shoot. You know, she just wasn't, she was in a chair and she was, sick and she was getting IVs and she just like wasn't able to participate early on um, in the way that uh, you might want a documentary subject to be able to. And so Enrico was standing in sort of describing what was happening. And then of course, as Julia gets treatment, you know, that's one of the things that became so amazing in the film is when we first set out, we were like, how great will this be to see Julia walk again? You know, uh, and I don't think it's much of a spoiler because they're in the public eye to say that, that she's not walking now, but there's this incredible moment in the film 
where the whole family realizes how much they've grown, despite the fact that Julia is still in a wheelchair and, and that they can, they can still live their life despite the fact that this thing has happened to them and that there are ways to find joy and, and, to, and to find progress and to um, still celebrate each other and their community and the people that they love. And so I think, you know, early on and even with Dr. Spector as well, you know, um, we sort of decided that we were making a love story more than anything, you know, and, and on the, on the human side that that's what this story was, was, was people whose compassion was so strong that you couldn't question it, you know, and I think when we thought about how do we make something that other people and that skeptics can't really push back against, it's by showing people who are so full of grace and so full of compassion and so full of love that like, you can't say a bad word about them because they are modeling what it means to show up. Um, the other thing that I'll say on that is that we didn't want to just choose people who were just victims. Um, we wanted to choose people who were finding their own ways to fight back. And I think that Julian and Rico uh, are doing that in their own way. Neil was obviously doing that with his research, was, which was a, an absolutely incredible example of someone using their experience as a way to help others. But I think that Julian and Rico, just, just in finding joy, just in not, um, not being consumed just by the diagnosis um, and the fact that they were still living and the fact that they were still thriving, the fact that they were still laughing and celebrating, to me, that's a form of, of, of fighting back. Um, and so we just very early on realized that both them and Neil and then all of the other people in the film as well, were going to be better subjects than, than, than we were. <laughs> I think <laughs> go back to that, we just, it was a tonal thing. Like we wanted the tone to be, and I actually got this great compliment the other day after an interview that I did out here in Oregon for the, the NPR affiliate program, where um, the guy who was doing the interview said, I, you know, I, I, I recognize that it was an activism based film, but I didn't feel overburdened by the activism. It didn't feel like it was beating me over the head. It felt like it was just showing us something and allowing us to step into this space to understand how hard it would be to be a Lyme patient. And I think that's, you know, that's an incredible compliment because that's what we wanted to do was to create something that was accessible in that way that didn't feel like you were getting yelled at, um, but that felt like you were allowing to, you were, you were entering into these people's worlds and they were sort of showing you um, what it's like and so that you could begin to understand how hard this is for patients. So Phyllis, I'm wondering whether you're, you have the same feeling that I have that the story was so elegantly told meaning we weren't being yelled at, but I wanted to yell, you know, because, <laughs> because I wasn't being yelled at, it was just boiling up in me and making me want to yell. And Phyllis, I'm wondering if you had that same reaction yeah. when you saw the film. You know, it's yes, but no. I think what I was so proud of, what I, as a, a viewer and one who loves documentaries, what I loved is I could invite someone to come see that film who knew nothing about Lyme disease, not one thing about Lyme disease. And then I could also bring someone who'd been suffering for 20 years and both would feel affirmed and educated. And that is so hard to do because you're absolutely right. You get really hard, um, heavy into the activism and the person who knows nothing about the subject is out of it, right? It can't relate at all. So what I loved about the film, and yes, I've been angry for years, so maybe I've just learned <laughs> how to cope with my anger, but what I loved is I thought this can be shown to anyone. It could be a whodunit, right? There's an element of that, like you're going, okay, what's going to happen next? Mary Beth Pfeiffer and her calm her almost narration of, and then this happened, and then there was this article, her calm demeanor just kind of keeps through the whole thing, just kind of keeps us focused. And to yours, we're not angry. I mean, just kind of. So um, I, I think I, what, what I'm so happy about is I think this is going to have widespread appeal to anybody. And you mentioned this earlier, I think it was you, Lindsay, that said, um, you know, you you wanted to make it for more than the Lyme community. Because believe me, the Lyme community needs so much support. But if we're really going to change the narrative, we got to reach everybody. And that's the beauty of this film, is anybody could reach it. And I think any Lyme organization can, can watch this and say, yeah, this is it. I'm, I'm actually hoping this might be a unifying film for the Lyme community in general. Like, this is what we all agree upon. And it explains 
why there's been years of misdiagnosis is it explains why insurance doesn't cover it because you know i speak matter of fact we just had our dart for art event i speak and i actually because the film is coming to san francisco i was able to say i know you're out there you know as our guests wondering why insurance doesn't cover it wondering why it's so high, hard to diagnose because think about it, most people are just coming to a fun party and they're like what what are you talking about <laughs> i said go see the film <laughs> it's much better than me you know talking on for you know hours and hours so that's the beauty of the film but rich yes of course i'm i i just can't believe i can't believe actually we're all here making a podcast about this right i mean <laughs> why are we doing this i mean why is there this 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 void with this disease but yeah yes yeah. so so yeah. lindsay i i um i, I i'm going to come back to uh being a lot less elegant than phyllis uh, because I was angry and I want to tell yeah. you what made me angry, right? Yes. And, yeah. and, and I want you to sort of share with the folks in our community who are listening to this podcast sure. where the intent was, right? Because you introduced yeah. us to a couple of really beautiful people. You yeah. introduced us to this beautiful young woman and her dad and, and her family and the pain they're going through. You introduced us to this really beautiful man who, who is, you know, has one foot in the secular world and one foot in the scientific world. And he's a beautiful human being, but he's also a, you know, a brilliant researcher. And you're bringing us down this path where we're really, you know, to use Winslow's term, we're falling in love with these really beautiful people. And then you see them in pain. And then you guys cut away and you bring in somebody like Mary Beth Pfeiffer, or you bring in someone like, um, you know, like Pamela Weintraub, and they very calmly tell us how this is happening, why it is happening, and how it was avoid avoidable. Then you bring us back to the people we're in love with again, and you show us the pain they were in again, and then you show us why that shouldn't be happening, and you bring another calm voice in and show it to us. And it was pissing me off and pissing me off and pissing me off and pissing me off. <laughs> so maybe I'm not as kind as Phyllis, and maybe I'm not as emotionally stable as Phyllis, but holy cow, did you guys really have me furious. So Lindsay, yeah. was that intentional? Or no, it wasn't. Emotionally unhealthy. No, we did I, not I, make- I, I was just going crazy. No, we didn't make the film to make you really pissed off, Rich. But, you know, I think the situation is infuriating. How could anyone watch what's happened and learn about what's happened and not feel feel angry? I think that anger is a very healthy, normal emotion. I think the question that we were asking when making the film is like, um, how can we help people channel their anger in a healthy, effective way? You know, I think like, we were saying before, we didn't want to make the film an angry activist film because people have a hard time hearing anger, whether it's your partner or your child or a documentary, like anger is just hard to engage with. Um, that said, we are finding that the film is a very, watching the film is a very cathartic experience for a lot of people. And I think it's actually, even though we didn't make the film to tell the Lyme community what's going on, because as Phyllis said, I mean, the Lyme community already knows what's going on. Although I will say that even my own mother learned some things. There are some things in there about the diagnostic test specifically that a lot of people don't yet fully understand. We were able to visualize it with uh, graphics in a way that will help people advocate for themselves and others at the doctor's office. Um, but we, but so even though the information and the story isn't news to the Lyme community, I think that the film is for the Lyme community in the sense that A, it will help people in their lives understand what they're going through, and that's helpful. And, you know, B, we have many other big goals that we could talk about later, but also C, lastly, it can help people feel all of the feelings that they have about this. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of sadness. I think that, you know, the beautiful thing about watching a movie is that, you know, whether you're watching it alone or with others, you, you can have, a, you know, you know, your own experience. It's a personal experience. You know, people can watch it in the privacy of their homes and they can cry and <laughs> have their moment with their families. I mean, we've seen people in tears in the lobbies after screenings family members apologizing to their children i'm sorry i didn't understand sooner you know people who didn't believe in their loved ones now finally understand um and then you know 
if you're if people are watching it in a in a more social setting that's also beautiful and healing too because you're generally going to be around other people who have been through it as well and you know one of my friends who's a, a lime a fierce lime advocate for almost 15 years now her husband walked out of the screening at the end and he was sobbing and i've never seen this man cry before and i've known them for you know going on 10 years now and he said uh you said it all. And I had a conversation with them recently about that. And he actually shared that they feel like they can actually start to move forward with their lives because they feel like there's something out there in the world that is doing the explaining for them. And they don't have to try to convince anyone anymore. And that is just that I was like, you know, we have all these plans for what we want to do with the film and some of them are already happening and, and we'll discuss that later. But even if the film just does that, even if the film just helps people cry for the first time in 10 years or their their loved one finally believes them or they feel like they don't have to exhaust themselves trying to defend themselves anymore, or explain to everyone around them why their experience, their life experience is unique and hard then like i feel like i'll speak for myself but i think i can speak for winslow as well and that that impact alone is just that's just huge and i can be at peace if that's the only impact we make but we have we have other plans <laughs> yeah i'm just rich the only thing i'd add to that is like i think we do we do want i mean it's it makes sense to be angry as Lindsay said but I think what we realized was that the facts are angering enough. Like the facts are like just laying out the facts is outrageous enough to give people the response that you're talking about, right? And so that was the decision is like, we can just put these out there, people can watch it and they'll they'll have that experience. It didn't need to, you didn't need to hit people over the head with it. And so, and I think that's like why we chose the characters that we chose. Like, of course they have anger, you know, but their their way of expressing it was in this this way that was like, bigger than themselves that allowed people in to sort of understand why this was so hard. So I, I think one of the things that I find to be the most frustrating about the Lyme experience after spending the last almost three years of my life focusing on this and interviewing over 350 of, of you folks um, is that it's almost always been avoidable, right? And, and, and there are just so many different places where if we took action, the illness wouldn't happen. So for example, when I was listening to the two of you share your, your stories, yes, I heard what Phyllis did, which was, hey, both of your moms had Lyme, and there may be an, a, a, a congenital component of this for you. But what really struck me was your two brilliant young people uh, who went to really good schools and obviously have a very powerful skill set. And anybody who watches this, this film will know how brilliant the two of you are. But neither one of you had the capacity to keep yourself safe despite having the intellectual cap capacity and have the educational information that would have allowed you to, to, to break the cycle before it ultimately boiled over, to use your term, Winslow, um, and, and just, just some basic information from an educational system that both of you would have absorbed because you're both really smart, and Lindsay, you're very kind, but you went to one of the top colleges in the country, certainly on the East Coast, right? So it's not like you're a dummy, right? But you didn't have the basic information you needed in order to be able to, to stay safe, despite you guys being able to do that, right? And then, and it's just, so what, what kept, you know, what kept, you know, causing me to well up with anger, I'll admit I cried too, uh, but I don't like to confess that too often, um, <laughs> is, is, is that is that there was just opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to stop this chronic illness from destroying these people's lives and destroying their families' lives, but, but those opportunities were missed, right? And, they, and there were just so many systemic changes that we can put in place and so many systemic protections we can in place that will stop this from happening that we're simply not doing it. We'll get into those parts of the, of the story where there are systemic flaws that are actually exacerbating the problem. I don't, I don't want to get there yet, but let, let's talk about those, uh, those pieces, Lindsay, where, where you were pointing out how often we could have prevented these illnesses from either happening or from becoming chronic, yet, um, yet those opportunities were lost. Yeah, I think, you know, there are a lot of diseases that we're being faced with right now, right? COVID obviously being one of them. 
I think something that the Lyme community has struggled with, and we really hope the film can help organizations like Phyllis was saying at the Dart for Art event. It's like this film makes the case for why Phyllis needs to be throwing fundraisers to help kids get diagnosed and treated with Lyme disease. The general public doesn't really understand that Lyme disease is not just like any other disease. It's not just like the many other diseases that need more research funding. I mean, every disease needs more research funding, right? I mean, we live in a world where there are new emerging viruses and, you know, the permafrost is melting and releasing virus. I mean, it's just crazy. We're inundated with this messaging, right? So people become a little jaded and I think they kind of start to like their eyes start to glaze over a little bit. But what makes Lyme disease unique is the fact that, like you just said, this has been fumbled. This has been massively fumbled. And that also includes the controversy, you know, and, and Phyllis and I were talking about, you know, you know, we should get into why we didn't shy away from the controversy. And it's like, you can't tell the Lyme disease story without getting into the controversy. The, the, the whole disease is controversial things could have happened and they didn't. And it's not because people are not smart. I mean, we have incredibly brilliant people on this planet. We have so many of them. For some reason, those people were not involved in Lyme disease from the beginning, or if they were, they, they got off track, you know? And so I think it's just really, it's really important in, for us to communicate to the world that Lyme disease is unique in the sense that this didn't have to happen. It doesn't have to keep happening. We should have a test that works. We should have and, and could have diagnose, diagnostics and treatments that are effective and not even just one. We could have all sorts of, I mean, it's just, it's been almost 50 years since Lyme was discovered. And yet here we are having this conversation. <laughs> and and so in, in that sense, you know, we, Winslow and I, we were advised from some people early on to just avoid the controversy. Don't make a film with the line, with the controversy in it. And we naively thought, oh, okay, I guess, well, then maybe we'll just make the film about the science. You can't even talk about the science of Lyme disease without talking about the controversy because the science, the scientific progress has been stifled over and over and over again. I mean, the things that we uncovered that are in the film we were shocked. We were shocked, not even first and foremost, as, as patient, as a, uh, as patients, we were shocked. We were like, this, this research was being done in the eighties that shows that Lyme disease can do X, Y, and Z. And now we're fighting for the, those very facts to be recognized by the people who were conducting this research. Like this was, this was a mind boggling process for us to go through as, as patients. I mean, it was and it was very uh, it's very intriguing as a filmmaker doing an investigation, but it had very real implications for our lives. You know, like I'm afraid to have children because I'm afraid of passing Lyme to my children. Like this is serious stuff. You know, like I've had friends who have lost children because they had Lyme disease and they didn't even know that they had Lyme disease. It's like this is really, really, really serious stuff. And I know that we know that, and the community knows that. But to try to communicate that <laughs> to the masses that yes, it is this awful and it is it is so unjust and it didn't have to happen this way. Okay, I'm going to bring us back to the film because I know there's um, some questions and we want to get on to your impact campaign and we could talk about all this forever. But remind me how many hours, Winslow, how many hours <laughs> did you shoot? I mean, how you so think of that. So now you have all these interviews, yeah. you've gone all over, you know, I'm always fascinated at film festivals when they talk about it ended up on the editing floor or sure. you know, that you have to figure out how to make a cohesive story right in an hour and a half or in two hours or I know yours is shorter than that. But how did you do that? Walk us through that. How did you how did you decide? And, and I know you had the subjects, but even what clips to put in. <laughs> it was a very long and difficult process. I think we had 700 plus hours of footage, um, which no one would want to watch. Um, but we could do like a museum exhibit, just let it roll for 700 hours. Um, yeah, you know, I think that when we went into post, we quickly realized like, 
okay, we've been following sort of the, the global Lyme story, but we did have some things that we really knew were going to be sort of key components, but then it just became the whittling process of like, what can we say with the footage that we have? Um, and that was a process of, of, you know, building out our characters. We knew that at first we had, you know, we kind of right away, we're like, okay, we're going to have three, even though we had filmed with more. And that was the Bruzesi's, Dr. Neil Spector. And then we filmed a lot with Lisa Tori as well, um, who has a lawsuit against the IDSA. And she was so incredible. And unfortunately COVID happened and we couldn't keep filming with her. And so that, um, that made it so that we couldn't really include her story in the way that we wanted to. Um, and so we were building out those buckets. And then we were also, we knew that we wanted as Rich actually, as you called out earlier, um, which was really nice to hear that you picked up on this, that there was this weave between the present day and the history. And so the history was meant to, um, we, would, we would show the present day and then we would go back in time to explain why what was happening in the present day was happening, right? What decisions led us to now? And so we always knew that that was gonna be that weave. And so we had to figure out, okay, what are the best scenes that we have with these characters? Where do they leave us off? And then what can we say in the history that then explains why it's so hard for them? Um, and so that was just a, a long, long process. And then during COVID, we actually, even though we had 700 hours of footage, we had to go out and film more. And so during COVID, uh, I ended up driving back across the country um, to go get that final interview with Mary Beth Pfeiffer. And so she's sort of one of the ones in the film who's kind of, you know, I would consider a spine who takes us from point A to point B. Um, and so we went back and, and Lindsay was on Zoom and we had what, like a five hour interview with her <laughs> where um, we sat with her and, and we said, here's all the things that you've said in your book. Here's all the things that you said in previous interviews because we had interviewed her twice at that point. This was the third interview. Um, and we got sort of what we needed to allow us to make those transition moments that made it feel more seamless that we were moving in and out of these things in, in the proper way. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a real dance. I mean, it was a whole massive team effort. Um, we had an editor named Mark Harrison, who was incredible. Um, and, um, and we all just sort of chipped away at it as, as best we could until we finally found something that worked. I mean, I think our first cut was what, five and a half hours or something like that. <laughs> And it was not easy to watch. Uh, and so then it slowly it, it moved from there. Uh, I think at one point we had it down at 97 minutes, but I think it ended up at 101 is the final the final runtime. Well, and I've heard filmmakers often say, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of if, if we could have had a tape recorder back to that first conversation, you know, seven years ago. You know, you start off making one thing, right? This is what we're going to do. And then it's kind of like the documentary gets a voice of its own. And there's the finished product, which is what is brought to you, like, right? What you capture on your film. Well, yeah, because we weren't making a film about something that happened. We were making some, a film about something that was actively unfolding. And so, yeah, you're so right, Phyllis. We, we had so many ideas that were evolving endlessly. <laughs> until the very end which is when we had to decide like okay what are the most important points there's so much important information there's so many incredible people so many interviews so many lives that didn't make it into the final cut and 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 again it, they are all so so valuable but we had to make a story that people would sit through that they would feel that they would understand and with the information that that we thought after years and years of researching was the information that people needed to take away yeah well and you've done that and i've also heard you say that you could make shorter clips with mm -hmm. some of these stories that you'll be can be releasing those which will be very powerful yeah. okay so tell us okay so now you've got the film made and you're going to enter into the film festivals talk mm -hmm. to us about that i mean how was that so you're you've you know you got it down to where you like it and where you're going to uh, show it and you went to was it hot docs your first was that your first that was your second? the premiere yeah that was the world premiere yeah. hot, hot that was docs. the world premiere yeah so tell us about uh, that and how it was received <laughs> and you know during yeah, yeah, totally. incredibly nervous uh yeah yeah i think that um spending seven years on something and then showing it to the world is is a nerve-wracking experience <laughs> it continues to be um you know, it's interesting. I feel like I, I just got to show it in Portland, which was really exciting to a whole bunch of friends. And that was scarier than anything, anything else that we've done. Because when you know the people, you, you care a little bit more about their opinions. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, Hot Docs was amazing. I think that 
um it's the you know it's what the biggest documentary festival in north america i think and um it was such an honor to get to be there and we were part of their special presentations program and we were voted into the audience top 20 um which was i think for us just a special place to start because it was actually completely outside of where our networks were it was in toronto um and so there wasn't a huge i mean there is a lime community there as well but it wasn't a huge lime presence actually at the film and the goal for the film was to break outside of the lime community so it was our first test to see how we did on that front and we had a really incredible response and we had all of these people watch it um and and respond just you know in really powerful ways that they understood it that they were outraged um that they were wanting to take action that they were wanting to know what to do but I think also, you know, the first response that we got was a woman who did have Lyme. And that was the first, literally the first response to the film that we had ever gotten. She raised her hand and she started sobbing. And she said, this is the first time I've seen my story told in 20 years. And then when we saw her out in, her lo in the lobby, her parents came up to us and said, we haven't believed her this entire time until we came here today and watched this film. And that was response number one to the film. And so I think that was just so, so special. Um, and since then, yeah, we've been in 20 plus festivals. I think that, you know, it was a long time coming and credit to you, Phyllis and Scott, for understanding that um, films take a while. I think that you guys both had a film film background because you go to Sundance and you and you believe in documentaries. And it was just so special to have your support in that. And I think that even though it took so, so long, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of with the film is that we actually spent the time to get to know these people and to enter into their lives. And you see Julia grow up over the course of the film and you get to watch Neil spend three years trying to revolutionize the science that he did. And if we didn't spend the time, the film would not be nearly as powerful. That's the thing that I always say is because we've had, you know, other films have been made and, and, and um, there's always this question of how does your film feel different? And that's what I say is you can't buy time, you know, and we, we really did spend spend the time and that's the thing that I'm most proud of and I'm so grateful to folks like yourself who allowed us to spend that time and who understood that that time was what was going to make this film special and so to be able to to do all that and to to put so much into it and then have it um emerge to to a global audience I mean it was just such a such a special moment and the Brzezies were there and they were up on stage and Julia is just she's just so incredible she's grown into the most amazing young woman and she um, the way in which she advocates for herself and for uh, the disability community is just so powerful and beautiful. And so having them there was just a real special treat as well. Yeah. Yeah. And OK, so now we're in 2023. So what now? So the film is made. It's there's some screenings. Matter of fact, there's one in San Francisco this coming weekend. But take us through your next steps. Because yeah. yeah, I always I always say this is step two. Like it <laughs> is, and it's the most it, you know. Well, it's hard to say it's the most important step. Every step is so important, but now it's like this is our moment to launch this out into the world, and it's 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 really on you know our little team and <laughs> the people listening to this podcast, the Lime community, whether or not this story is heard, you know we all have our little cell phones that are so powerful so at this point we you know we keep saying it and it's true that you know the, the quiet epidemic is not just a movie it's a movement we never made this film to just like you know make people angry or sad or <laughs> it's like we wanted to make a film that would bring up these emotions and then help people channel them and guide them into making real tangible changes at the local level you know people are signing up to host community screenings so this is what we're doing now we have an impact producer named kate halabozik who is working so hard every day we have 100 plus screening requests right now from 12 countries and counting people are bringing the film to their their children's school auditoriums they're bringing the film to public libraries they're bringing the film to universities and and like we said earlier even medical schools and they're hosting panel discussions as well and q and a's they're making events around them people who have authored line books are showing up you know chris newby was just at our screening and in, in utah 
uh, which was which was hosted to benefit LymeDisease.org's MyLyme data project. So this is what's really exciting about the film is that we didn't it's not it's not our film i've said this to you so many times phyllis it just yeah. it does not feel like our film right. this is a film that we want everyone to be able to find a purpose in you know like i said in the beginning that question that the nurse asked like do you have a passion and you know i think having a purpose did really help us you know and we hope that by making this film we can pay that forward to other folks too you know if you've been wondering how to make a difference wondering how to fight back like we are here like our team is here and we are working every day <laughs> to to really bring folks together around this and so so whether you have the bandwidth to host your own screening people can do that or they can you know nominate someone reach out to a local Lyme organization or even just a local school i mean any we have non Lyme affiliated organizations who are hosting because people that they love and trust are telling them, hey, this is a really important, credible story that that you and your community should know about, even if it's just for for their own children. You know, it's like people or their pets. People need to know this. So so the community screening tour is something that we're really excited about. We're putting a lot behind that. Winslow and I are going to be traveling around the country in May because it's Lyme Awareness Month. People are hosting screenings for their legislators as well. It, 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 there's just there's so many ideas that people are coming up with. I had a call yesterday with a friend who who thought that it would be great to bring the film to a, a local uh, rehab center where a lot of people are in recovery from uh, drug and alcohol addiction because of Lyme disease. <laughs> you know, it's like wow, I love hearing these ideas from the community. I mean, people are always always reaching out with brilliant ideas and. So that's that's one of the that's Wait, one wait of let's the, see. So so okay. back, so let me interrupt you. So someone's yeah, yeah. listening. Someone's listening yeah, yeah. now and is saying, yeah. "I want to do that." So yeah, yeah. So how? So so can anyone host a community? Anyone. anyone. Anyone can host screening. Anyone. So can how host do you do you shoot the film to them? I mean, how, literally, how does that work? So you go to our website. You go to take action, and there's a host a screening section where you put your information. And then our impact producer Kate follows up, and then she she guides people through that process. And yeah, so anyone can sign up to host a screening. And, and what is your say your website? It's thequietepidemic.com. <laughs> and we also right. have, you know we have our social media, so that's another part of this. Really, we just need to bring everyone together. We have Instagram, it's the Quiet Epidemic. We have Facebook, which we just got. <laughs> Facebook would not let us title our page the quiet epidemic for a year, the first year of our launch, we couldn't even title our Facebook page the quiet epidemic until a couple of weeks ago, so this is a big moment, we really have to play catch up, so if everyone listening would go to our Facebook page. Uh, and and like and follow us that would be hugely helpful because. And our, so, our social media also demonstrates the scale of the problem. And here we are going around the world being like, this is an epidemic. <laughs> and we currently have, I think, like 4,000 followers on Instagram. So we really need the Lyme community to show up to help us reflect just that we know how big this is. You know, okay, and there's an app. Really matter. And an action item for anyone listening. Anyone. And it's free. <laughs> And it's you're exhausted, you're in bed, but you have your phone nearby yes, exactly. or your computer nearby. Yeah. If that's the only thing you can do, do that because then you'll feel plugged into our team. You'll feel like you're not alone. You'll recognize that you're a part of a really incredible community of people who have walked through the fire or still walking through the fire and who are trying to do something about it. So that's a place to start. And then people can also sign up for our newsletter at thequietepidemic.com as well. Another action item on our website at the on the take action page is to send a pre-written uh, pre letter to Congress. So we have a pre-written letter that basically, you know, is getting at what you were mentioning earlier, Rich. It's like we need congressional federal oversight of our research dollars to know that they're actually benefiting patients. We need benchmarks. We need to know, is this, is this funding being used appropriately? Is it being mishandled? Where is the funding going? You know, we need folks to recognize, we need our legislators to recognize that this is a public health crisis. It has been, and it's going to continue to be unless we take action immediately and we need them we need watchdogs 
you know, unfortunately, our, our federal health agencies have not handled this properly, as we all know. I hope that they can turn it around. I, I know that they have smart people working there, but, you know, it might help if we had someone, you know, or, or a few people in, in the government saying, hey, what's going on? Where's the funding going? Why don't we have a test? When are we going to have a test? Why isn't insurance covering these things? How can how do we fix this? So we need we need we need reinforcements from outside the Lyme community. We all know that the burden of solving this cannot fall squarely on us. And it has been for far too long. And we've done incredible things. <laughs> we've done such incredible things. It's amazing to see what the community has done despite being so you know, burdened with illness. And, you know, I mean, it's it's just, it, that's not to say that the Lyme community is not amazing, but it shouldn't be on us because it's not just about us. It's about the people who are not yet sick. It's about the right. people who haven't been bitten yet or who haven't been, you know, gotten Lyme in utero. I mean, it, we know that we are fighting for people who don't even know that Lyme disease exists. Yeah. And so we need the government to step up and so you can the letter with one click. <laughs> So, so Phyllis, I, I, I want to wind down these, these young folks have been very kind to spend two hours of their evening Absolutely. with the two of us. And, uh, and, and I want to, I want to join in the call to action that Phyllis, you just began and, and, and Lindsay so eloquently argued, but I want to sort of tie it back to uh, how we started this podcast and how we started this podcast is an enlightened nurse or, or, or healthcare professional approached Lindsay and, and Winslow and said, Hey, we see patterns of success. We know that this is a physiological disease. We know that this is an emotional disease, but this is also a spiritual disease, right? And the people who have the best outcomes are the people who recognize that the spiritual element of this disease is one where you have to find purpose. You may feel miserable, you have no energy, but what will be helpful to you, not just to the world, but will be helpful to you is when you're serving your purpose, which is to help other people because we are beings who have been made to serve. And even when you're at your sickest, if you take the time to serve and find a way to serve, it will benefit you and you will be improving on your health journey if you help. And one of the wonderful ways of doing that is to join the folks who have, who have begun to develop this movement, the folks who are, who are giving you an opportunity to share this beautiful story with the world so that it can make the changes that need to be made and I'm going to ask all 15,000 of our Instagram followers to please uh, move over to the Quiet Ec Epidemic um, <laughs> Instagram page. Every one of us needs to be following that page, and every one of us needs to be a part of that movement. And to the extent that you've not yet found your purpose, uh, both Lindsay and Winslow and the beautiful Phyllis have given you an opportunity to now have a tool that will help you to pursue your purpose and to have a purpose which will help you on your healing journey. So again, thank the three of you for, I wanna thank the three of you for the brilliant work that you're doing and what you're putting into the world and the opportunities you're giving other people to not only learn about their disease, be validated, to have, have an understanding and their families have an understanding of, of this terrible uh, challenge that they're going through, but also give them an opportunity to, to find purpose. Thank, uh, I can't thank the three of you enough for everything you're doing. Thank you so much, Rich. So and I want to say I want to say one thing in closing too, as being a funder of the film. If any, if any of you who are listening want to become involved financially, um, or know someone who wants to become involved financially, I I I'm I know Winslow and Lindsay are going to be. Uh, 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 this is not comfortable for them to ask. It's comfortable for me to ask, and it's been a ball to be involved with them in this way. And it it does, it be, as Lindsay said, it becomes part of your DNA and part of your story. So come join the fun, uh, whether it's you know, a, a five dollars, a thousand dollars, a million dollars. We welcome you. <laughs> just totally. come, come, literally, just come join the fun because having the funding is going to enable them to be able to take it into the world further. That's all it really is. It's a funding thing. So I'm yeah. glad that you mentioned that, Phyllis. It is uncomfortable for us to mention, but yes. by not mentioning it, it makes it seem like we have everything that we need. Exactly. And we do in the sense that we have the vision, we have the team, we have incredible people who want to help us bring this to Capitol Hill, to bring it into med schools. We have people who, you know, PR team who wants who wants to help and, and also marketing agency. Everyone is ready to go. 
the only missing piece is funding and we have nonprofit status. So all donations are tax deductible. <laughs> that's good. You added that part too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> why, why don't we give uh, Winslow the last word? Uh, the man who looks like a filmmaker will now talk about uh, the impact that this uh, film has had on his life and on the world and and uh, we'll let him have the final word. Wow. Okay. That feels like a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, well, I'm just grateful to be here. You know, I, I really appreciate you giving us the time, Rich, to talk about this. Um, Phyllis and Scott, we, we've told you, but you guys are the angels who, who made this all possible for us and the ones who believed in us first. I think that maybe the last word can be on that. You know, I think that when we showed up at Phyllis and Scott's house, we were very, very sick. Uh, and, um, but they they saw something in us and they allowed us to uh, fulfill something that, that we were trying to do. Um, I think that if anything, this film shows that it takes a community to heal and that we all need each other and that we can't do it alone. You know, and I think that that's so clearly shown by, um, the Brzezzi family, the way in which they care for themselves, the way in which the community saved them, the way in which they thank the community in the end of the film by bringing them all together and say, thank, thank you for letting us get to this moment, to this moment of joy. Um, and Neil as well, you know, Neil, Neil had his whole family that held him up through his hardest times, and he was trying to be that family to everybody else. Um, and so I think if there's any lesson in that, it's just that um, it's okay to ask for help and that um, you'll be surprised at who reaches out and, and is willing to help and hold those people close because we all need that support and um, it's hard enough as it is when you're, um, when you're trying to do it all your own. So thank you for having us. And I hope that the film can, can get out there and to be the tool that we want it to be. You know? and, and to your point, I think that there are so many of this is so, so much of this is so avoidable, right? And so if we can get this to people early, then maybe they won't be the ones to go on to be chronically ill. Thank you for listening to your Tick Bootcamp interview with our guest, Lindsay Keys and Winslow Crane Murdoch. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Lindsay Keys and Winslow Crane Murdoch, please visit their website at The Quiet Epidemic. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of Tick Bootcamp Podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick by Blueprint. It has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past guests on this podcast. We urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com forward slash bite to view your blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on the podcast platform of your choice. And finally, if you'd like to search our podcast library of over 350 episodes, subscribe to our email list, or share feedback, please visit our website at tickbootcamp.com. Thank you, as always, for listening.